welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in um, from wherever you are. I see more people are coming in, so we'll just let them in as, as we go along. So good. And um, I just want to quickly give, give all our panelists a chance to just kind of briefly introduce yourselves. I know it's already in the chat, I think, the, the names of our panelists and the and who we are, but it would be nice to just kind of get our voices out. My name is Wakanyi Hoffman. I live in the Netherlands, and I am at the moment for this workshop, for this conference, wearing the hat of an, of an educator. And I'm working uh, on looking at ways in which we can add Ubuntu ethics and values into AI systems um, to build a better world that is um, values-based uh, so that we can sleep better knowing that AI knows who we are uh, at the core of, of our humanity. So who do we need to become? Not about what are the values that we share in common as human beings. And I'll hand it over, I'll just do popcorn style and hand it over to Dominic because he's right next to me on the screen. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Akanye, and uh, hello everyone. It's great to be part of this great conversation. My, my name is Dominic. Mosia. Uh, I see a lot of colleagues from other parts of the world call me Mosiah. It's all right. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I am the executive director and co-founder of the Kenya Education Fund, which is a scholarship organization uh, in the space of providing educational resources uh, to children transitioning from elementary school uh, into high school and university. And it's a comprehensive package uh, that provides mentorship, uh, life skills, reproductive health, um, career readiness, uh, so that as they grow up, it's not just about academics, but it's also about becoming a responsible citizen, a, a responsible adult who will make better decisions for themselves and for their communities. Thank you. And you can just pass the baton to someone else. Uh, Barnaby is right next to me on my screen. Thank you, Dom. And, and hello, everybody. It's a, a delight to be here in community. And my, my name is Barnaby Willett. I am currently uh, in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And uh, I'm working as an educator, a contemplative, also as part of a technology startup, MindHeart AI, which is co-founded by Dr. Sarah King, who is known for her work on the science of social justice and her systems-based awareness map. Uh, MindHeart AI is also co-founded by Dr. Eve Ekman, who has worked with the Dalai Lama to develop the Atlas of Emotions. Personally, uh, I do work, contemplative work through alliwork.org, where we're looking at how to cultivate this inner relational dialogue with our own private face to the divine, which to me is mirrored in the way more of us now are engaging with generative AI through this dialogic structure. So thank you again for, for being here, and I'll pass it to Shai. Thank you, Barnaby. I'm so thrilled to be with all of you today. Uh, my name is Shai, and, uh, and I would say that, uh, that my main um, occupation in life is as, a, is as a, an academic philosopher. I'm um, currently a postdoctoral researcher in the, in, in, at the University of Leeds, UK. And uh, what I'm engrossed uh, in is how the project of how we can uh, cultivate our consciousness, cultivate human consciousness in the face of AI's apparent consciousness. So that's, that's uh, the, my main interest. Uh, uh, however, I also deal with uh, the fields of transformative philosophy, Eastern philosophy and practices, um, and, and, and self-transformation. And 
I also develop uh, all sorts of therapeutic and uh, transformative methods based on the, uh, the potential of our consciousness, the, the expansive potential of our consciousness, and uh, teach uh, how we can transform ourselves. So in short, we can say that, that my obsession in life is the potential of human consciousness, its potential to expand and, uh, and to influence our human life. So now I'm passing the torch to Angel. Uh, hey everybody, um, Dr. Angela Costa here. Speaking of mothering and parenting, I'm here with my, my son, so you'll see me come on and off screen and and, and play bubbles. Uh, maybe that's part of what we need to do with these AI systems. But um, but yeah, I'm a healing centered educator um, and I'll be brief with my responses. Um, and my son, Sydney, will be joining me today. Say hi, Sydney. Hi. <laughs> Thank you, I'm excited to be here today. Welcome, love it. Love that we have a little one with us. Maybe he could he could actually add to this conversation because he's the future. He represents the generation that we're working to mother AI systems for. And so without further ado, I want to dive into the question of why we're even talking about AI in the context of reimagining the education system. And what I want us, each one of us is to really reflect on what does artificial intelligence actually mean to you? What does AI mean to you? And how much AI do you actually use currently? You know, and, and for what reasons? And what excites you the most and what terrifies you the most? So it's kind of three questions in one. What is AI to you? How much AI do you use? How much AI are you excited? How much, how excited are you about artificial intelligence and how terrified are you? And maybe you can also give reasons for why you're excited and terrified. So I'll just uh, drop the ball on, just randomly go to shy because <laughs> you, you picked my interest with the consciousness. Yes, well, I, I'll gladly, um... Uh, attempt to answer your question. I, uh, first of all, let's start with the personal uh, um, perspective uh, or uh, how I um, work with AI. I make a lot of use. Um, I, I use uh, generative AI tremendously uh, throughout my my day. I I would say that I that I use it as a sort of uh, extension of of my mind. It would never uh, replace uh, my ideas, my insights. I'm always, in this sense, the source of my ideas and insights, but it certainly assists me in the, since I'm a, a content creator. So I'm, support, so, so I'm meant to constantly produce uh, uh, materials and, to, and, and it's also useful for honing my language. So it, AI helps me very often to think about things more thoroughly. It doesn't uh, uh, solve my uh, questions, but it helps me think, and it helps me uh, search for sources and for uh, for uh, connections between things. I don't necessarily feel that it makes my life easier. To be honest, it's actually a, a very stubborn and uh, and and hard uh, dialogue uh, on on both parts of the of the on both sides of the dialogue and there are some stunning moments in which i feel that, that as if it can understand as if it actually learns and many other moments in which i feel that it's it is plain silly and completely helpless so of course i'm aware of what it's going to be in one year or two from now and that's that's going to be uh, uh, quite unbelievable now for your question it's very important to, to say AI doesn't uh, uh, intimidate me at all. I think that uh, that AI, uh, like many other things, although although AI is is very unique in that it is, for the first time in history, it's like a, an apparent mind, apparently competing with the human mind, and uh, and it seems like it is an other something else. It is like a competitive species, but it is also our ex the extension of our mind. So it is like our mind, but it is it might be identical. So this this gives rise to so much uh, confusion. 
but uh, I think that that what we need to do is to uh, to treat AI as an opportunity, because uh, it is our opportunity to ask the question: um, what it is to be human if AI can take over so many uh, mind-like, uh, so many uh, uh, mental tasks, uh, so many intell intellectual tasks. Most philosophers and most discussions uh, engaged with uh, AI um, um, are busy asking the question of uh, whether AI can develop consciousness or not, whether it can understand or not, how we should restrict it or not. And I think we, we don't deal enough with a philosophical and a psychological crisis that might be turned into an opportunity. So what we need to ask ourselves if we embrace this kind of opportunity is, is how we can finally define all those elements or in humans that are irreplicable, things that cannot be imitated and therefore are truly, uh, truly uniquely human. And because it's quite inevitable that all those elements that are imitable are going to be imitated, are going to be replicated. And this is going to, this is, this makes the question so urgent for the first time in history. I think finally we're pressed uh, into asking who are we? What is our role in the greater uh, scheme of life? And if we uh, do uh, take, our, take on this opportunity, I think this AI is not a reason to be uh, scared, but actually uh, perhaps a key to our further evolution. I like how you, um, you referenced AI as sort of taking on this parent role. And, and with here we're talking about mothering AI. I look at it the opposite, actually, as a child, and that we are the parent role uh, mothering AI. So it's interesting that we have those, mm. we can put it from both ends. And from that perspective, you know, you also asked, you know, could AI be mirroring back to us who we think we are and therefore stretching us to understand and to question who can we become, right? Because some of the tasks that we thought made us human are now, you know, uh, have not been replaced or will be replaced as we go on. So what does what what does it mean to be human? What does it become? What who do we become if our tasks, our mental tasks, our intellectual tasks that we thought we we hedged our identity on are now taken over by by something else that's more than human or beyond human? What does that what what does it be, mean to become human? And so I'll drop this. I'll pass it. Mm -hmm. I'll pass it on to Barnaby. Um, perhaps you can add to that, and then maybe then pass it on to. Dominic, who can tell us mm. what it means to be human, really? And also the question, the three questions that I asked. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, Wakanyi. Uh, th these feel to me like the two most important questions. What does it mean to be human and, and who do we become? That, that to me is the heart of the conversation around AI because I notice and perhaps driven by both fear and greed, the attention we put on AI projects, we're projecting um, all of these uh, capacities or sentience or beingness onto it, when it's really, as I see it, a technology, a powerful technology based in the same graphics chips that drive video games, right? It's now just bringing in this linguistic capacity presently. And so I use it regularly. It's a useful, powerful tool. Um, what terrifies me about it is the way that it may contribute to a uniformity of thinking and a reification of ego. What I've noticed myself and in conversation with friends is that ChatGPT, for example, likes to affirm our ideas. And if all of us are sitting in our rooms and it's mirroring back our ideas and telling us how on point we are rather than challenging them, um, I'm worried that we will start to 
uh, identify with our egos even more, more fully, and to do it without the accompaniment of an embodied experience or an interconnected uh, experience, which is reflected by the Ubuntu values. Um, what excites me is that we as humans have limited capacity to understand the whole, uh, the whole which I believe is the foundation of who we are, the, this Ubuntu values, the whole, the oneness. And my hope is that AI can model or reflect this interconnection of the whole in ways that our human brains uh, are challenged to do individually. Um, so, so these are, are what comes up for me in response to your questions, and, and I'll pass it to Dom. Thank you. Dom, take it away. Uh, th thank you, Barnaby. Um, I think for me, it's important, first of all, to mention that I'm, I'm in Kenya. Uh, and AI application and or use may not be as advanced as it may be in other parts of the world. So I look at it from that context. Uh, personally, I, I use the same in a very limited manner at this point, probably when I am writing a speech, uh, I, I will go to chat uh, GPT and or uh, when I'm in a meeting, then I am assisted to take notes. So, so, so I think uh, the way I understand it at the moment is that AI has become to be an extension of ourselves and also an opportunity to stretch our time. Because when you are doing one task, you have an assistant who, has, who is helping you uh, do it more or do another task while you are engaged in this particular one, or even help you put your idea in a better package, package it in a, in a, in a, in a better manner. And I like the fact that uh, th there are concerns as to whether at some point we may lose the ownership of that idea or the fear is that we may actually end up losing the ownership of that idea so what 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 excites me i i think that the excitement is that it's still new and it's extremely interesting we, we thought that with the advent of the mobile phone maybe that was the greatest innovation and it was going to be for a very long time but now we have something else that everyone is talking about i think it shows uh the growth of the human potential and our ability to continue discovering uh, new things. Um, uh, am I scared? Uh, am I terrified? I, I have to admit that I, I am. Uh, maybe because I have watched a few movies where machines get to a point uh, and they start thinking on their own. What happens? I, you know, if my machine and my neighbor's machine start having a conversation, then what happens to me and to my neighbor? I think that's a genuine concern uh, or not. And then the other thing that uh, scares me and especially coming from the part of the world is that for the most part, we see very good technologies being designed by people who are not in Kenya. Someone sits in Silicon Valley, for example, another part of Europe, and they come up with a very advanced technology that we are supposed to use in Kenya or in Africa, uh, do we suffer the risk of losing something in the process? Because I, I would like to see a technology that takes into consideration our cultural aspects of life. Is that going to be factored by this technology when the person coming up with that uh, innovation is unaware of our cultural dynamics and our societal dynamics in another part of the world. Are we going to lose something? Are we going to present a bigger risk to the receiving uh, society because the technology never incorporated the smaller societal communal dynamics? And I think this is a very interesting conversation. Yeah, it's quite a unique uh, plot twist. We were speaking up um, and extending what Shai mentioned around this moment, putting pressure on us to um, ask the question of who we are. Um, the long, the long-standing idea was that 
extraterrestri extraterrestrial life would descend upon us. And that would put some kind of selective pressure for us to ask that question. So I find it ironic that it's something that we created that is generating the reflection. Um, I, I use AI extensively. Um, at the core, it's you know leveraging it with some of the, the softwares that like like ChatGPT and its ability to create custom GPTs where you can kind of train it on your own data. I'm really fascinated with creating uh, my own data sets and leveraging these tech these technologies to process unique um, kind of custom subjective data sets. Um, so, for example, I'll train a system on my yearly goals um, to help kind of hold me accountable or or at any moment to be reminded of what some of those goals are. But I'm also kind of interested in subver subversive ways to leverage AI. So I, I designed a, a custom GPT that literally decolonizes education. So you can talk to it about ways to decolonize your classroom instruction from, from, from a variety of subjects. So that's unique. You know, how do you leverage these technologies to challenge the very formation of the technologies in the first place coming out of a colonial order. So that's one of, that's another question is how do we leverage the technologies to do the work of subversive um, deconstructing of the systems that cause major suffering in the first place. And lastly, my big concern mainly, um, it's not a fear that these technologies take over. Um, I think um, that fear is not necessarily as pressing for me my fear is that we'll continue to extract raw, raw materials from a finite planet and continue to extract labor from underprivileged and under-resourced people globally that'll just lead to more climate change, mass migration, geopolitical polarization, and the social inequality that, that creates and that generating a vicious negative feedback loop. So not the technology itself, but the ramifications of our desires to be in a perpetually growing economic and political order. Thank you so much, Angel. And I'm, and I'm glad you brought in the issue of the material component of AI, because I, I think one of the confusions in the world right now is that quite a lot of people don't actually understand that AI takes on what, what, it, what it actually does materially. Right, it's built on resources, natural resources. It takes natural resources to maintain AI systems. And we might not actually have that capacity over time. So there's a question of sustainability. There's a question of can this thing live on as it is? And what 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 is at stake? What do we stand to lose? You know, it's natural resources, it's communities, it's cultures that have existed for thousands of years. Um, it's landscapes that will be shifted in, in many ways. And so from that lens, we can start to look at values. What are the values that we need to build sustainable AI systems? And if you're looking at, at it from that perspective, I guess my second question to, to us here would be, in your field of service to humanity, and I say service to humanity rather than in your work, in the profession that you're in, because your profession is really a service to humanity, right? How how best would you then use AI to improve your particular work? So I want you to really just zoom into your particular place in the world, the particular value that you bring into the world, the particular service that you give to the world. Without AI replacing your particular way of serving the world, how would you best use it to minimize the harm that we're talking about, but to also embrace this system, because if we don't embrace it in a particular way, it will still function as it is. But can we use it in order to, um, to serve the world? And so in your particular industry or in your particular profession, in your particular place in the world, how would you use AI? I guess, how would you advise somebody to use AI to serve better? And I'll start with... Um, Shy. Well, that's a fascinating question. And actually, I think um, that this very panel uh, uh, prompts me to think about uh, AI in different ways, uh, uh, new different ways. Well, I would say, first of all, uh, I think that, that AI is, is generative AI, at least, uh, is here to, to, help us, uh, uh, to help us be free 
to uh, to um, think uh, or to be to be more available to think about uh, to, to think more deeply or to to enhance or to tap into dormant uh, uh, potentials of our reflective self-consciousness which means that that if it if it takes care of many uh, material many technical questions that uh, or many technical tasks this is is supposed to to um, enable us to be available to to turn uh, in many different directions and to uh, to uh, to activate those parts. So, so uh, if we take, for instance, philosophy, I think it's really interesting that there is a, a philosopher, uh, his name is, uh, is uh, Sven Yolm, and he made an experiment. He asked uh, Chad GPT about uh, what uh, Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher, might think about AI ethics. And then he said the, the, the Chad GPT, the, 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 the AI generated, a, an excellent question, able to, to compare those two fields in, in ways that actually uh, somehow uh, uh, superseded the, uh, uh, his own ability or his student's ability to produce such, such an, a, a, a quick, efficient answer. So this means that in terms of, uh, of, philosophical, of uh, philosophy, for instance, we may not be so needed anymore to be walking encyclopedias, <laughs> which means that, uh, that uh, perhaps uh, accumulating knowledge as an academic value is no longer so important as it used to be. All these kind of, uh, of thinking of something that, that someone uh, says or, or, or when we encounter a certain school of thought and when, then we say, oh, this reminds me of something that I already know. All this, 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 kind, this, this kind of thinking is rendered, uh, rendered quite meaningless right now, or useless. So I think that, that with AI now we can finally be free to, uh, to go more deeply into, into our own, into more serious questions and to use AI to, to help us uh, encourage this kind, foster this kind of deeper thinking, not to rely on it to uh, answer our questions because it is really unable to do so, but it can help us develop research questions. It can help us uh, uh, think about those questions. It can help us with comparative research that we no longer need to conduct perhaps, not, not in, in, in this kind of technical uh, degree. It can help us think of uh, uh, interrelations between disciplines. So since as uh, Barnaby said, uh, um, AI uh, is like uh, the broadest uh, uh, um, storehouse of knowledge uh, on earth, something that no human brain could ever uh, contain. Uh, it can actually uh, serve us as this kind of, uh, of dynamic encyclopedia which means that it's not just uh, just written text, something that is completely static, but something that helps us think, that thinks together with us. Uh, uh, there are two philosophers, uh, David Chalmers and Andy Clark, they developed uh, uh, what, what is called the extended mind theory, thinking of, uh, of uh, all kinds of technological devices as the ex extension of the human mind rather than something that is outside the human mind. So I think if we begin to think of it as, as an extension, it could help us uh, uh, mirror our own questions, help us uh, uh, deepen into our own questions. So th this, is, this is just one field. Of course, there are, uh, the other fields that I, I deal with can also be uh, supported by it, but I don't want to, um, to take over the discussion. So um, please. Thank you so much. More than human, I like the idea of one one human mind, but also it terrifies me because it ties into what um, Barnaby was talking about, this idea of flattening sort of, could AI also, frighteningly, flatten our adventure in, on this planet as, as, in, as unique individuals in that sort of one human mind. And so I, I want to build on that a little bit and pass it on to, yeah, to Barnaby, sort of build into that. How in your work would AI be used to serve better? 
well being mindful of the risks mm. on the environment particularly yeah yeah i think it's a, a really challenging question around the the risks to the environment um there's like an arms race with the large tech companies to build um, massive data centers. And we're really just at the beginning of that. Um, imagine data centers that are 10 times or 100 times larger than they are now. So you see big tech companies now partnering with um, nuclear power providers to expand um, that because they want to have power with low carbon loads. It, I don't know the answer to this question. It's really challenging. Um, and and perhaps it invites me to meditate or sit with what is the impact that I have by engaging casually with generative AI. Um, as for how I use it, I would say the instance that has felt deepest to me in terms of a relational, generative, holistic engagement with with AI was it was near the end of 2022 and uh angel who's who's in our panel here he was the the uh, director of the garrison institute fellowship that i was part of so we were all gathered together in community at the garrison institute in new york state and feeling very deepened by community uh, i woke one morning and and felt this inner dialogue these inner uh you could call them words of a wisdom coming through me and I wrote them down just as a, as a whole it felt very alive and deep for me and then I went to generative AI maybe six months later and um, created images and eventually a short film to match these words and I felt like as I was working with the AI offering a phrase and trying to find the image that matched I was in this artistic flow of human creativity and machine-based creativity. And there was an output, this film, that felt like a really lovely complementary creation. So that for me was a really beautiful way to use this technology because I'm not a visual artist. I could not create those images by myself. Um, and uh, so that, that to me has been the most meaningful uh, of of interactions with with the AI. That's a beautiful Barnaby. I hope you can share with us that that film. I'll put and, it in the uh, chat. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely love the idea of almost uh, collaborating with thousands of people. Really, that you you may never be able to find in your in one lifetime. So that's that's brilliant. And lastly, I'll go to Dom. What? How in your world could you foresee AI being? useful to serve the education system in Kenya and also at the same time ensure that it's not um, creating more harm on the planet? Um, <clears throat> thank you. I, I, I will borrow a few tips from, from uh, Barnaby and, and Shai uh, and, and start by explaining part of what I do. Uh, this involves receiving thousands of applications from rural Kenya uh, about students who are seeking for opportunities to go ahead with education. And for example, receiving over 5,000 applications and then end up interviewing, let's say 600 of them and eventually selecting 160 each year takes a long time, you know, anywhere between three to seven months. Uh, and if we could use a system that, one, allows us to kind of identify the students who can proceed to the interview stage without having to go through every application, uh, I, think, I think that would be a good thing. Uh, but also, um, listening to, 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 to some of the colleagues here, maybe even coming up with the right questions to ask that can help us make those decisions. Because we, we might have been asking the same questions over and over. And 
with time things might have changed or things have changed then do we need to change how we conduct part of these processes such that by using this technology or using these assistance we are able to have the right conversations with potential beneficiaries of our program uh, that is part number one part number two is that once our students have a scholarship we stay with them for at least five years the entire high school and part of their college and university. Could we use some uh, predictive models using technology to kind of figure out what programs will suit them better as they near graduation and invest the right resources in ensuring that their chances of succeed, uh, succeeding are increased? If we're able to kind of figure out where they will be uh, four, five, six years from now, then we are likely to employ the right resources and take the right measures in advance, you know, that kind of a thing. And if we can replicate that to the entire education system so that it's not just about going to school and scoring very well academically, but you're also coming up with programs that enrich the academic package so that these students emerge more successful, within a shorter period, you know, not having to try a lot of things for them to eventually land somewhere. So I think that could be a very useful use um, or a very beneficial use of artificial intelligence. Of course, the question that we asked earlier about then what does it make to be human? Because it's also true as you sit down with these kids and have a conversation with their mothers and get to know their background and all that, creates some form of relationship, then if we lose that, then what does it mean as pertains to the relationships we have with our students for the next four, five, six years? And I see that we don't have a whole lot of time and I want to just be mindful of that. So I'm gonna quickly jump into the next uh, sec section of our panel here, which is a quick presentation to introduce this concept of Ubuntu and what those values are. And then we can maybe have a, a, a final discussion on how we could build these kinds of values into the education system to ensure that actually AI isn't the focus, but that a value-based education is the focus. And if AI is reading us, what it means to be human, it's reading us from that perspective of what we, are, we collectively believe to be human values. And so I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully it, it comes up. And it's a very quick um, presentation. There we are. No, that's not it. Um, can everybody see that PowerPoint? Yeah. OK, yes. we're going to go backwards. We're going to start from the beginning. So what is Ubuntu? Ubuntu is. It's an active verb and others can say it's a verb or it's a noun, but I think it's just an active verb. It means being human. And it's usually captured by, in this phrase, in several phrases, one of which is the most popular one is I am because of who we all are. And, and there are lots of expressions across Africa about what Ubuntu is. So some people will say a person is a person through other persons. Um, others who say a person is, is, is an extension of other people. In my mother tongue, Kikuyu, I'm from Kenya as well, uh, as, as is Dominic, will say, Modoneado, which means a person is other persons. So basically means the same thing, Ubuntu. And it's an expression that you find really quite across Africa and particularly uh, East, Central, and Southern Africa. Um, and then there are five Ubuntu principles that were identified by, um, really we would call him the, 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 the godfather of Ubuntu or formalizing Ubuntu principles into academia. So I'm wearing my academic hat right now in respect to J.S. Mbiti, who came up with these five principles of Ubuntu as a roadmap towards becoming human. Again, going back to the idea of what, what Ubuntu really means, it's the idea of becoming. So it's a process, it's never uh, uh, an aspiration that ends at a particular point, but actually a continuous way of being. And these five principles are survival, solidarity, 
respect, and then compassion and, and then dignity. And I'll explain what they really mean in, in, the, in the next slide here. So this is Ubuntu in action. And um, several philosophers have called it a moral theoretical framework or a moral uh, consciousness or, a, or an individual agency. I, I like to think of it as both. It's, an, it's, it's unlocking your individual agency in order to cultivate your moral consciousness, to become better at being human, right? So the first principle being survival, that's really where we, we are talking about unlocking that individual agency. So a child is born with no knowledge of what is right, what is wrong, and they learn from, from observation, they learn from the environment, they learn to survive on their own, and they need they need to unlock several skills such as um, emotional intelligence, which includes all the different aspects of intelligence, whether it's your physical, your spiritual, your social, and so on and so forth. And then you have this, uh, from there, once they are aware of what their body can do, what their intellect can do, what their, 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 the other people around them are able to do, that's an extension of who they are. They become aware, right? So there's that awareness of I. It moves into the question of, can I survive on my own? Obviously not. So from that survival mode, this person then starts to form bonds of relationships with others, right? This is where that, that statement, a person is a person through other persons, comes through, right? You, you become aware that while I'm, I'm, I'm capable of surviving on my own, right, in the bush, if you may, I can't actually survive long term on my own. I need others. So these relationships begin to build from that uh, awareness. And from there, once those re relationships have been cultured and cultivated, respect emerges. Respect grows out of relationships that are, are strong, bonds that are strong, demand respect, right? And respect also um, brings in equality. You start to treat each other as equals in a pack, right? And from there, then compassion is a, is a byproduct of this equal, respectful bonds uh, of relationships. And, and empathy is compassion in action. It is a lot like Newton's third law. Every action every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? So that reciprocity, that constant giving and receiving and being careful about what it is that you're giving and receiving comes out of this lens of being compassionate, being able to put yourself in the other person's shoes, being able to mirror yourself, your humanity, seeing yourself in others. And so the final principle of Ubuntu is a lot like the concept of enlightenment, one would say, dignity where you're able to see all of life as part of you. You are life and life is you. So this concept of continuously reflecting on the interconnectedness of all of life. Who are we? Who am I in the grand scheme of things? The universe is in me the, and I am in the universe, right? And so is everyone else. In Japanese, they'll say inochi, which means life. So life is not one person or one community it's actually the entire thing right the, the planet is part of of this entity life and we are all part of it so what does it really mean to dignify all of life and if you're looking at it from the lens of artificial intelligence can ai mirror back that interconnectedness that interbeing that we are not separate that in fact our ideas and our thoughts and our cultures are reflections of our highest aspirations right from different parts of the world. So Ubuntu practice sometimes is described as a feminine ethical framework for nurturing people. And, and feminine, I'm talking about it not as a woman uh, uh, necessarily, but as this energy that is in all of us, that, that we are nurturers. We are, we're naturally capable of nurturing. It takes a village to raise a child is what, you know, that's, that's the most famous African proverb. So that nurturing doesn't say it takes, a, it takes a, a village full of women to raise a child. It literally takes all of us to raise a child. So what does it mean to unlock that nurturing um, spirit in humanity, to be able to look at AI as something that we are responsible for, all of us? And can we use those feminine ethical principles in each one of us 
to actually nurture this thing, this artificial intelligence, and be able to produce something that reflects our values as humanity, so that when our kids, the future generations, are interacting with artificial intelligence, what's baked into it is this, these ideas, these principles that we hold true to our, our being. And oh, I think someone needs to be admitted in so I can carry on. Let's see. Somehow I'm not able to move on with my, um, with my. We can we see it. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so we'll go back to that. So why do we need to mother AI systems? Um, this question came up as we were discussing this panel and, and, and figuring out what does it even mean to be mothering AI systems? AI systems, as we know right now, are biased. Um, culturally not representative of 8 billion people, not representing 8 billion aspirations, but generally representing parts. And so it's pieces of a puzzle, but not the entire thing. So we all need to participate in building this thing if it's going to be a part of us. We can't afford to have this knee-jerk reaction, which I had myself, thinking, I don't want to do anything with AI. That's not my thing. That's coming out of Silicon Valley. We're just going to ignore it. The more we ignore such a thing, the, the less we are able to, to interact with it and to challenge it and to even contribute to, towards making it a better representation of who we are. So we need, we need all of us to get involved, to moderate it. A lot of the content in there is representative of many worldviews, but not a shared um, a set of principles. And in order to get to a shared set of, set of principles, I think AI needs to read the entire content of all our worldviews. And we also need to bring, to come in there to understand how do we need to communicate in a non-violent way. We've had leaders in the past, the Mandelas of this world, the Martin Luther King, Wangari Mathai, Jane Goodall, who's still alive, as examples of nonviolent communicators. Can AI systems learn to communicate like that? Could that be normalized? We would have to come in there to normalize that, that way of communicating. At the moment, we're so divisive and our, we've, we've run out of ways to communicate. Can we come in there and learn to communicate better and teach artificial intelligence to communicate the way that we want to communicate? We also need to think about what it means to flourish as one community of life. All my relations, that's, that's an intelligent way of, of flourishing, not as, 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 as one whole system, but many different communities of life around the world coexisting in a way that is fair, in a way that, that, that ensures that everyone is able to flourish in their own individual way, but that also as a, as a community, we can flourish as one global community. And what does it mean to become peacemakers? Because ultimately that's what we're seeking. That's what we're talking about. That's the, the greatest fear we have is that AI has this potential of creating more harm and harm comes at the cost of, of peace. So peacemaking is a duty and responsibility of all human and now non-human intelligence. We can't afford to, to step away or not get involved in something that's presumably representing us. So what does it mean to be a peacemaker in that space of, of AI? And here I, I, I wanna quote a, a dear friend of mine who came up with the concept of having moral AI agents as agents of truth. We're all those agents now. You know, all those bots have been, have been created by humanity. You know, like Angel said, we created this thing. It's not another intelligence that came from nowhere. We actually created this intelligence that's now got its own intelligence. So can we become this moral AI agents that when we're interacting with it in whatever capacity in our different uh, uh, areas of, of service to humanity, that we're able to be agents of truth. And then finally, the whole point is to become cultural weavers of these ethics and values in AI systems, because ultimately that's what we are. We're only here for a short amount of time. And 
we are who we've been waiting for. So in our period of time on this planet, what is our greatest task? Our greatest task is to find ways in which we can connect the human family to reduce harm, to reduce conflict. And these principles of Ubuntu are the original principles of what it means to be human that were identified by our earliest ancestors. So these are all human qualities. They, they, are, they are relatable to all cultures and all human beings. They're not just African values. They're actually values of humanity. They are a consciousness that live in all of us. And, and ultimately, this is what we want if we are going to interact um, carefully and responsibly with AI, is that we want to be able to combine this collective heart intelligence, this natural intelligence of, of the human, this Ubuntu intelligence, if you may, with that artificial intelligence, all our cultures, all our data, all our cultural data is out there. We want to be able to combine these two forms of intelligence and come, come to a place of a collective holistic intelligence which looks a lot like this, right? Where no matter where in the world you are, whether it is, you know, I'm here in the Netherlands in a, in a little city called Groningen. Um, Dominic is in Nairobi, Barnaby is in Quebec, um, Shai is in Leeds and Angel is in New York City. No matter where you are in the world, we want a future in which every child, every person can feel comfortable in any community where human beings are. They don't feel oppressed, they don't feel uh, unwanted, and they feel a sense of belonging. That's what it will mean in the end when we interact with AI in a way that is truly representative of our values as humanity. And that is the end of my presentation here, which will not move on. <laughs> so I'll just stop sharing. Thank you. So that's that's what I wanted to share in a nutshell. Ubuntu is 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 a set of principles. They are concrete enough to understand, and they are adaptable enough in any culture. And that maybe that's what we need. That's what we really need at the end of the day is a framework of ethics that are relatable cross culturally, that can be used as a base, foundational base of building AI systems, so that no matter what AI system you're using, you can sleep and rest knowing that your child is interacting with something that interacts from, a, from that human, collective human uh, values uh, based way of being. And from there, I want to just pause and ask if anyone member of our panel here would love to add just something to that. I see Angel's got- Yeah, just, uh, just appreciating that framework and uh, to nurture it as much as possible. Um, my encouragement is that, my recommendation is that taking frameworks like this and actually begin to build some of these, to build custom GPTs or overlay these kind of frameworks over existing AI models. And, you know, at some point when they can become a little more affordable, begin to build out um, these kind of models to kind of be, begin to have moral agents out there. Um, because I think what will happen is, You'll have, as we as we begin to evolve with with this these these co evolve with this technology, you'll have uh, people, institutions, and organizations that'll 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 use AI as they've always as technology has always been used for profit for malicious activity. So we need a counteractive and countervailing force. Uh, so I encourage a lot of creativity. I encourage as much use as possible, um, as soon as possible. Thank you so much. We have like three minutes and I just want to hear from the from the audience because we've been talking a lot and maybe we can just throw it to the audience. If anyone has a burning question or a remark or any last remarks, hi, Dai, please take it away. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing the Ubuntu framework. At the beginning of this year, I, I am a priest for the Balinese kingdom. Uh, and uh, I would focus on a sacred calendar where all the all the high priests we use it to govern uh, all the uh, everyday uh, activity from giving birth to when to give birth to uh, all the sacred ceremonies. 
And so I was asked to uh, do an evaluation or how to integrate for the big innovation center in uh, uh, the UK and they're the British parliament think tank. And I wanted to ask everybody. And so as we, at first, as a comparison, how to integrate spirituality into AI, I looked at it as a, a more of a dialectic uh, uh, comparative uh, uh, analogy. But as I go deeper into AI, I realized that, you know, uh, having an energetic calendar with cycles like the behavior uh, environment on a daily and basis can really help influence. But what I'm interested in, to, and ask all your panel there, uh, is there any way we can incorporate AI where we can have, let's say, 500, uh, you know, high priests, uh, padandas, to, to regulate it? And, that, and that's why Bali's the living culture using this uh, uh, this this cycle uh, uh, calendar is because the they they are they're the check and balance, and and I just don't believe that. We can just turn all of our behavior environments and daily uh, calendar over to AI and have it regulate it without having some form of uh, collaborative uh, uh, integration with the with people that knows the calendar and regulate the calendar through generation of, of, of being priesthood. So uh, anyone can answer that question. That'd be great uh, um, to add to this. Thanks so much, Hi. I think what you're what you're alluding to is is something that also Angel touched on is can we build can we come together you know specific groups of people like you're talking about the high priest could come together and build their own custom made AI system right that then becomes the sort of the the guardrails for this calendar I think that's plausible now that's something we can do so it's it's a lot about what can we imagine what we can use AI for can we imagine can we start using our imagination. And actually be able to come together, you know, smaller groups of people will, it will take smaller groups of people with same interests, same ideas to build a particular uh, AI system that can be governing, can be the, the group of moral AI agents that we're talking about. That could be its own custom made AI system. Uh, and I think that's possible now. Okay. I think we're coming to an end of our time. I see Sophie has written something in the chat, but I just want to throw it, you know, just one more remark from anyone. And while uh, at the same time, just say very grateful and uh, to everyone who's been here listening to us. I hope this has been as interesting and as, as uh, rejuvenating and not as terrifying a, a thought to think about what AI is capable of, but we can imagine what we are capable of and then AI can, can copy that. <laughs> so anyone with last remarks? Well, I, I just want to say that I've, I've been really thrilled to, to uh, discover this kind of uh, question that you hold, that you pose, and it's like a question that is opposite to what I do or complementary uh, more accurately, uh, because, because I think uh, while I'm interested in the parent, the consciousness of the parent and how the consciousness of the parent can develop as a result of uh, of uh, this encounter, this invaluable encounter with its uh, with its uh, child. You are uh, bringing up this kind of question of, of how this uh, how the parent can uh, can nurture a child that that uh, uh, mirrors back mirrors uh, it's 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 the the highest potential of the parent. And that is really fascinating. So I'm really grateful uh, for, for this kind of uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. And I think my last remarks would be just to build on to what Shai said. Think of AI as our newest child that's just been born, maybe slightly immature, uh, prematurely. And what are the values that we need to give that child so that when they go out there, they're able to cross the road they know exactly what the red sign means. Red means stop, green means go. That's basically what we are at right now. We're at that crossroads where we can we can all get involved and we can all get involved in, in our different capacities in, in the different places that we serve the world. Mm -hmm.